What are some ridiculous history facts? Part 1. In 1895, the entire state of Ohio had only two cars. Both cars managed to still smash into each other. And this is why we had 55 miles per hour as our maximum speed limit for so ducking long. Abraham Lincoln's son, Robert Todd Lincoln, was present at three different presidential assassinations. After McKinley, he decided not to accept any more invitations. Also, also, Robert Lincoln's life was saved by John Wilkes Booth's brother, Edwin, a famous actor who pulled him out from a train that was about to drag him under its wheels. 101 years ago, a massive tank of molasses burst open in Boston, causing a sticky wave that killed 21 people and injured well over 100. The Great Molasses Flood spread at about 35 miles per hour. Now that's what I call a sticky situation. When Alexander the Great was a child, he was reprimanded by a teacher for wastefully throwing two whole fistfuls of rare incense into a sacrificial fire. When he was an adult and captured Gaza, which happened to be the prime agricultural source of the incense he wasted, he sent home 18 tons of it to the same teacher as a gift. Was that a have some of this valuable incense? Or it's not so rare after all, is it? The first known political cartoon is Egyptian and shows Hashipsut, the only woman pharaoh, pegging her lover and chief architect Senmut. There's a children's book called The Pharaoh's Secret that kind of gets into this. Interesting book. Former US President Andrew Jackson was approached by a man who pulled a gun on him. Smaller history fact, this was the first assassination attempt on a US president. The man pulled the trigger and the cap went off, but the gunpowder failed to light. The man pulled a second gun and fired, but the gunpowder again failed to light. The assassin tried to get away, but not before Andrew Jackson got him and beat him with a cane. He also once won a duel by simply letting the other guy shoot him. He knew it would be a hastily aimed shot and probably not deadly. So he let the other guy just straight up shoot him. Then he carefully aimed and shot the other guy dead right there. He recovered from the wound rather quickly as well. Potatoes were not very popular as a food in France. Like they were seen as fit only for animals. Not only that, but they were considered generally not digestible by humans. So a pharmacist named Parmentier knew they were good food and wanted to popularize them among the working class. So he got a two acre farm to grow potatoes and placed armed guards around it at all times. People assumed armed guards meant something very valuable was growing there, so they began to steal the potatoes. That's how potatoes became popular in France's working class. During the Cold War, there was an idea to drop XL condoms labeled medium onto the Soviets to make them think we were anatomically superior and be more afraid of fighting us. Easily my favorite part of American history. American military members were also killed during the nuclear bombings of Japan. When American High Command was informed of their presence, their response was something like, targets remain unchanged. Nearly 800 Americans died training for D-Day. General Omar Bradley was stopped by MP during the Battle of the Bulge in World War II due to them thinking he was a Nazi infiltrator. The irony was that he was stopped because he correctly identified the capital of Illinois at Springfield when the officer thought it was Chicago. I've met plenty of people who thought Chicago was the capital of Illinois just because it's our most populated city. Montenegro technically was in the war with Japan for 101 years and they signed a peace treaty in 2006. Montenegro was aligned with Russia in Russo-Japanese war and they declared war on Japan, but they forgot to bring peace. 1904 Olympic Marathon in St. Louis. The number one finisher drove most of the race. He started the race, got tired and heat exhausted and wanted to drop out. He got in a car to DQ himself and headed back to the stadium, but along the way realized he was near the finish line and got out to claim the glory. The number two finisher was carried across the finish line by his trainers. On a bogus pseudoscience theory, the trainers had been giving him a mixture of brandy, egg whites and rat poison instead of water. When it came out that the number one finisher had driven most of the course, this guy was given the gold despite the help from his trainers to finish. For some reason, the number three finisher was just a regular guy who did nothing unusual. 
In this case, ordinary was not extraordinary. The number four finisher was a Cuban mailman who had raised the money to attend the Olympics by running around his entire country and asking for donations. When he landed in New Orleans, he lost all the money gambling. He managed to scrounge enough to get to St. Louis and attend the Olympics. However, he had no money for athletic gear, so he ran in dress shoes and pants hacked off at the knee by fellow racer who happened to have a knife. He probably would have come in first had it not been for the hour-long nap he took on the side of the road after eating rotten apples he found at an orchard near the course. The number 9 and number 12 finishers were from South Africa and ran barefoot. South Africa didn't actually send a delegation. These were students who just happened to be in town and thought it sounded fun. Number 9 was chased a mile off course by angry dogs. Half of the participants had never raced competitively before. Some died. St. Louis had only one water stop on the entire run. This, coupled with the dusty road and exacerbated by the cars kicking up dust, led to several fatalities. The Russian delegation arrived a week late because they were still using the Julian calendar until 1918, which effectively the rest of the world had switched to the Gregorian calendar. This was the most early 1900s thing I've ever read in my entire life. Once FDR died, Truman didn't know about the Manhattan Project, but when he found out, he subtly tried to tell Stalin that they were working on something big. Stalin was like, yeah, dude, I knew before you did, since he had so many spies in America. Oh, Truman. Henry Cavendish, the man who was vital in the discovery of gases and discovered hydrogen. He inherited a ton of money from his uncle and built a special castle, I think. He was incredibly introverted, so it was designed so that he would never have to meet or see any of his servants. He communicated with them through notes only. He did, however, appreciate other scientists coming to visit and talk. His works mostly came after his death, of course, but I found this guy interesting. During the Viking era, there was a leader named Sigurd. He allied with a Viking warlord named Thorstein. He wanted to conquer more land and expand his territory. He had already been very successful in doing so. This was until he feuded with another leader called Miel Bucktooth, or Miel Tusk, as his two front teeth were abnormally large and bucktoothed. They decided to settle their matters on the battlefield and both agreed on bringing 40 men each for the battle. However, Seaguard ignored the terms and brought 80 men. Bucktooth had realized he had been betrayed but did not give up. They killed a number of Seaguard's men, but alas, they were overpowered and were all killed. Here's the catch. After the battle, Seaguard ordered his men to behead all of the enemies and tie them to their saddles as trophies. However, as Seaguard rode home in victory, the severed head of Bucktooth pierced his leg, which led to an infection, killing him soon after. The capture of the Dutch fleet at Den Helder on the night of 23 January 1795 presents a rare occurrence of a naval battle between warships and cavalry in which a French Revolutionary Hussar Regiment captured a Dutch Republican fleet frozen at anchor between the 3 kilometers, 1.9 miles, stretch of sea that separates the mainland port of Den Helder and the island of Texel. After a charge across the frozen Zuiderzee, the French cavalry captured 14 Dutch ships and 850 guns. A capture of ships by horsemen is an extremely rare feat in military history. Hannibal's Defeat of Romans at the Lago Trasimeno By leaving soldiers to light fires in the hills, he created the illusion that his army was three days march away, when tens of thousands of men were actually concealed in the hills just above the lake. The Romans were surprised on the shore and trapped between the onslaught and the water in their armor. Half of the 30,000 Roman troops were either killed in battle or drowned in the lake. 5,000 were captured and the other 10,000 staggered back to Rome, creating panic that the greatest army in the world had just been handed their ass by a Carthaginian upstart. It was the greatest ambush in military history. Not attempting to diminish Hannibal's brilliant victories, but at that time Rome had only just started to expand into territories outside of Italy and its armies were still pretty old-fashioned. They were hardly the greatest army in the world at that point. Carthaginian upstart is also kind of misleading, as while Hannibal was young, he was a scion of one of the most powerful families in Carthage, 
and Carthage itself was considered to be an equal power to Rome, but it definitely was one of the greatest ambushes in military history. Before Abraham Lincoln became a politician, he was a champion wrestler with more than 300 bouts under his belt. Lincoln only lost one match in his career and he was inducted into the National Wrestling Hall of Fame in 1992. He also jumped out of a window in order to prevent a quorum. The Battle of Bull Run during the American Civil War was called the Picnic Battle because so many civilians from Washington went on picnics on the sidelines and watched. But once the battle actually started and the Union started to get its ass kicked, they all ran away, running over injured soldiers and dead bodies, and generally disrupting the battle. This was actually a relatively common thing during the Civil War. I know it happened at Gettysburg, too. Ancient Greek and Roman marble statues were actually painted and were colorful. A lot of statues paint faded away and went away over time. Some people cleaned off the paint thinking it was debris or dirt. Other people just plain cleaned and removed all of the paint off of them because they preferred the look of white marble. Rome was actually a very colorful city and it wasn't all made of just boring plain white marble. I'm taking a course in classic archaeology and it's almost painful to sit through my professor and discuss what the early archaeologists did. There are literally entire books of antidotes on this sort of Ben Franklin. That man was the OG of trolling. He was so good at trolling under the pen name of a female, Silence Do Good, he received several marriage proposals. Only then did he reveal her true identity. The Massachusetts colony banned celebrating Christmas. During that time period, many people used it as an excuse to get hammered and party. Another tradition was that the young adults would cross-dress, then go door to door singing songs and demanding food. This clearly doesn't fit with the Puritan lifestyle, so the governor banned public celebrations. People could still celebrate it in their homes if they didn't get too rowdy. I think it was unbanned when Massachusetts became a state, but didn't become mainstream until Christmas became a national holiday. Nashville briefly legalized prostitution during the Civil War. Union soldiers stationed there kept getting syphilis, so the known prostitutes were put on a large barge in the river. I'm a little fuzzy on what happened after that, but no, it didn't work very well. So it was legalized and prostitutes had to be registered or get a license. I can't remember which, and were required to have STD checks. This lowered the amount of prostitutes with syphilis because it was getting caught and treated. That lowered the amount of soldiers getting syphilis and made the army happy. It was outlawed shortly after the war ended though. I love how they stumble onto one of the biggest bonuses of legal prostitution, but then just revert back to the previous system even though they knew it didn't work. 1927 Liberian elections were referred to as the most rigged ever by Francis Johnson Morris, a modern head of the country's National Elections Commission, and also made it into the Guinness Book of Records as the most fraudulent election ever reported in history. As despite there being fewer than 15,000 registered voters, King received around 243,000 votes, compared to 9,000 for Faulkner. <laughs>